Hi. Um, thanks everyone for coming tonight and thank you to the Strand and Art Book for having us here um, so we can hear all about Dan's um, new book, Wolves Like Us. Um, so I was looking through Dan's bio um, earlier today and it talks a lot about his relaxed and collaborative approach and I think that that actually when looking at these images is something that completely makes sense to me as a photo editor looking at your work. Um, I think that that relaxed and collaborative approach is, is to me what maybe um, creates such a great environment for you to make these photographs. Um, so I've known Dan for a few years through working at different magazines. Dan's worked for um, magazines like ID, um, Teen Vogue, American Vogue, WSJ, um, Interview Magazine, and so many others. And I think that ease is something that really shows um, in his photography and just his general way of being um, as someone to work with. So everybody, um, Take it away, Dan. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, can we kill, guess kill the lights now? That's better. Oh, so much better. Um, so yeah, thanks all for being here. Uh, I wanted to sort of start, um, kind of give you guys a history of how I met the guys and uh, kind of walk you through some of the pictures in the book. I, lucky for you guys, we're not going to look at all of them. Um, my friend Crystal Mazel uh, met these boys on the street. Um, they had just recently left their home for the first time in their lives uh, and as a group they would kind of wander around and not really interact much with people but um, kind of lurk in corners and down alleyways and things like that. Uh, Crystal um, being uh, Crystal walked right up to them as soon as she saw them and um, as a filmmaker she um, approached them, got to know them and immediately called me and told me about these six brothers who were amazing looking and that I had to meet and photograph. So uh, I was doing some portraits in the studio that week and I told her to bring them by. Um, this is the first picture I took of the boys within about five or ten minutes of meeting them. Um, they were all more or less silent. Um, their hair was all, I don't think any one of them had had a haircut in their life to this point. If they did, it might have been a little trim or something, but they all had hair basically down to their waist and uh, th their gaze as you can tell is mesmerizing. They didn't really move much from there um, and they didn't say much. Um, as I got to know them and obviously they opened up quite a bit and I think um, it, we found out later that uh, after they met me that day they went home and I was known as fuck yeah Dan <laughs> to them. I guess I must have said fuck yeah a lot. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, let's see if I can manage these three things here. Um, eventually I managed to make uh, some arrangements to go to their house. Um, uh, for those of you who most of you probably know this, but for those of you who don't, they lived in uh, a housing project on, um, on Broom Street down the Lower East Side right by the Williamsburg Bridge, as you're passing over, you see them. Um, they lived in a three-bedroom apartment. There was six brothers, a sister, and two parents. Um, I didn't really know what to expect when I was going there, but I knew a little bit. I knew that they hadn't really kind of been out much in their life, and I knew that they loved to love movies and loved to make costumes, and that was pretty much it. Um, Obviously, once I got there, I was kind of blown away because everything they do is magic. I mean, um, the detail and the attention to precision in terms of what costume to put on, how to put it on, uh, how each stitch is made, every piece of tape, every little detail, there's a different goon mask for every single goon and every single Batman ever made and there's 
never two goons from different Batmans would ever exist in at the same time. They would never be wearing two of those masks together. They're always just right for whatever it is they're dressing up as. Um, it was it was pretty incredible, uh, to say the least. Um, this is, some of you guys remember, this is uh, Govinda as Bane. This is a... I'm sorry, that's that's Bhagavan. Sorry, I'm jumps. Still not that easy. Um, for me, as a photographer, the pictures came really easy. As you can see, it, this is you know kind of a gold mine in terms of uh, a photographic sub subject. These these guys were really uh, folk artists. They didn't. They weren't trying to sh show anybody they could do anything in particular they were just acting and imagining things and you know they had all the time in the world to to perfect it um this was i think the first piece they made uh this in this one obviously darth vader's mask the detail was uh most apparent um i was sorry I was uh, I was really blown away by this, and, I, and this was when I realized, like, you know, as they were coming out of their bedrooms, going through piles of clothes and reaching into, um, you know, shoe boxes full of costumes, each one cataloged perfectly, each one was um, labeled, and each one was different from the next one, even if you couldn't tell them apart. Um, the um, the Darth Vader mask was really like a big deal to me. Um, I remember begging them to let me have it, but still, <laughs> still don't have it. Um, this is uh, Makunda as Anton from uh, No Country for Old Men. Um, it's eerie, actually. It's it's the most insanely perfect c costume. I think this might be my favorite of all the ones they dress up and he not only dresses that way but he um, behaves just like how uh, Javier Bardem acted in, in, in the movie and so much so that w even when we're not dressing up or you know they could be in a car at a store or getting something to eat and the five other brothers refer to him as Anton I think he really wound up embodying this this character the most um, this is a picture of some of the <laughs> some of the masks as they they kind of piled up you can see there's four different Mike Myers masks um, for all four Halloweens and there's a reason for that. Like, there's a reason for everything that they do. Um, pretty amazing for some teenage boys uh, that weren't sort of socialized or, you know, given the opportunity to kind of lead a normal life. Um, they made some pretty spectacular things out of it. Um, one of the other things that the boys love is the 80s. Um, actually, since uh, since the film and the book and all the fame and everything that's kind of come along with it, two of the boys have even changed their names to what they call 80s names. Uh, Jagadish is now Eddie, and uh, Krishna is now Glenn. Because, <laughs> you know, 80s names. Um, but obviously, uh, Huey Lewis in the news, what's more 80s than Huey Lewis in the news? I think we all, the boys included, um, most of everybody here, if you're under 40, you were probably introduced to them by watching um, Back to the Future. Um, <coughs> we found out that, the, that Huey Lewis in the news was playing at um, Irving Plaza and obviously had to get tickets. It was, they were playing the 30th anniversary of their album Sports, which is kind of like where all their big hits come from. Um, we got tickets. Uh, I, I don't remember if I arranged them or Crystal did. I can't remember, but regardless, uh, the boys knew exactly when it was. They made posters. Uh, there's one in the book. Uh, they made posters for the show and we went and saw them. And we even got to meet 
the the band afterwards, which was pretty pretty amazing because uh, even I was a little starstruck. Um, we didn't. When I got there uh, to to see the show, the boys had been waiting outside for I think about six or seven hours, <laughs> um, and I think they beat the janitor there that day. They were taking turns, I think, going to Starbucks to go to the bathroom all day, and they packed lunches and everything. And I showed up. What for me was probably the earliest I've ever been to anything was 30 minutes early, and they were still you know standing there waiting to get in. Um, that was that I I mean. To see them at their first concert was probably like I've n I like a lot of things that I experienced doing this project. You know, you witness people, you witness these, these boys uh, doing things for the first time, and it takes you back to that moment for yourself. Um, none of them had voices at the end of the show; they were all screaming so loud, and I think they stayed up all night into the morning and maybe even the, all, most of the next day. I know that they stayed in, uh, they, they went to bed at some point the next day. I showed up to their house at about four in the afternoon and most of them were still sleeping um, because they were so excited about the show. And it was, I mean, it was great but um, for me, but it was just amazing to see them experience these things. And it was the first time that I had been out of the house with them. Um, mm. Obviously it was a great sort of, feeling to be allowed in, one of the only people ever allowed into the apartment, but now being sort of out and about with them and being able to see a show like this was really incredible. Um, at that point, I decided I really wanted to get them out of the house and out of the city. Um, so we went upstate and I, th I I don't know when it occurred to me whether it was right as it was happening, like a lot of things in this project, or when it was kind of just materializing, um, you know, beforehand. I don't know if I really realized, but, you know, these boys hadn't really run around in the country before. They hadn't gotten a chance to swim in rivers before or climb trees ever. And they're 15, 16, 17, you know, and up. I think they were between ages of 14 and like 21 at this point. So they came up with their costumes and they all dressed as reservoir dogs and we went out into the fields and we went out into the woods and they dressed up as, you know, characters from Stand By Me or they dressed up as like, uh, they dressed up as, God, Platoon, characters from Platoon, uh, Full Metal Jacket, Suburbia, uh, Friday the 13th, they were walking around town with, uh, you know, Jason mask on. Um, only in Woodstock would that not freak anybody out. <laughs> um, it, it was that point, I think, for me, that I realized w w w there, this was a... This was a project. I really didn't know what I was doing until then. I just knew that I had to take pictures of these guys because they were obviously incredible subjects. But I didn't know what I was going to do with all of them until I got them up there and we realized, and then I realized kind of, this is our middle ground. You know, this is, this is where my world and their world collides and it's in this imagination and this freedom of expression and the ability to kind of play and talk about movies. I mean, we talk about films and music and girls and like, I mean, everything. And it's therapy for me. I mean, it's it's like the most incredible experience of my life, I think, uh, certainly professionally, because not only was I able to take pictures of these guys um, and all their amazing kind of like imagine, uh, imaginations and creations and everything, they were they were like my therapists, you know, like they were bringing me back to a time when I was that age. Um, let's see. I think next is, oh, we went to Coney Island. <laughs> You can see all the people staring at them. There's so many. This was the hardest photograph to edit. I think I have a hundred just like it, and they're all great. I could have done a book just of the day we went to Coney Island. They wanted to do, um, uh, was it Lost Boys? Um, 
and so we went on the uh, the Ferris wheel or the uh, carousel, and they did their whole Lost Boys scenes, and they bit each other's necks like they had fangs, and it was about 150 degrees out that day, and they're we <laughs> they're wearing black trench coats and leather, and I was in a sh in shorts, sweating my ass off through my t-shirt, and they were like as cool as can be, which is annoying. <laughs> um, but they're amazing. I mean, they, they, they had so much fun. We, we rode that, that carousel, I think, ten turns, and no kid would get on it as long as they were <laughs> around. This is Eddie. Eddie's the youngest. He really made the most, obviously, I think, between adolescence and also sort of being the youngest when the boys were let out of the house. He made the biggest transformation, I think, of all. Um, he really went from like this really kind of quite shy, um, reserved kid to this guy um, and he's a beautiful beautiful guy he's like just such a sweet kind young crazy boy um, they all are so here's some more portraits in the studio we did upstate Govinda now has hair a little bit longer than mine. He's on the left. His hair was probably the most impressive. I think if he never cut it, it would grow for a mile. Um, and he cut it. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. So this is Halloween. Um, Halloween for these guys is not like it is for us. Halloween lasts a month for them, and it starts on October 1st. And every day is sacred. It is not a religious holiday, but it's the closest thing that I think these guys have and by a mile. And I think it's more of a spiritual event than most anyone I know in my life has. Um, Every day, from the first day of the month, they're decorating. They're putting posters up. They have, they, they, I guess they would get their mom to bring leaves in from the outside, dried leaves, and they would scatter the floor with dried leaves. By the end of the month, there's like six inches of dried leaves in the entire apartment. You can't even see any of the floor. There's posters lining every single wall. You can see some of them here. They're all in the book. Um, and, you know, jack-o'-lanterns, there's music, ear-bleeding Halloween-related music, which I don't know really music, it's more like screaming and, <laughs> and, um, and you know, horror films and things like that. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty incredible. It's very intense and it lasts a month. I don't know how uh, the parents put up with it every year, but that was, you know, if you've seen the film and if you talk to the boys, the Halloween was really kind of the impetus for starting the whole dressing up and the the costumes and everything. Because when they were young and not out of, allowed out of the house, and on Halloween they would look out the window and they'd see kids that were allowed out of the house. And they were all dressed up. And they were all, you know... You can see that from the 16th floor of a of a project building. You can see all the 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 wild costumes, and that was what I think made that Halloween so special because it was the one month of the year that they ruled the house. And so I was really honored to be a guest at Halloween there. Um, let's see. So here's, these are just a few pictures that were taken towards the end of the project, and I think they really speak to kind of how the boys have evolved in their own ways since I've known them. Um, they're not really the same kind of wolf pack they were when they first were out. They weren't, they're not, um, they're not like this band of brothers the way that they were. They still are in many ways, and like there's some still lots of love between them, and the connections are all there. But um, the costumes are becoming less referential, and the styles are becoming more unique. 
and um, Mukunda especially, he's sort of the leader of the pack. This is his own creation, you know, this is something that having known them now for five years and you see this evolution into something like this, you think, well, this might be how Steven Spielberg started or this might be how Peter Jackson or George Lucas might have started, you know, when they were kids. Um, this is another costume that Makunda made called Death. Um, so we shot pictures of death in the, in, in, in the graveyard. Um, this was the last picture I took of them as a group before uh, before kind of finally wrapping up all the shooting. I um, just have to say that these boys have made a really deep impression on me, um, each of them in their own ways. I, I didn't expect that going into it. I didn't expect any of this really going into this project, but the impression that each boy made, each young man really now, made on me um, is profound and my relationship with each of them is different and I think the biggest gift that I got out of this was they showed me how to reconnect with my imagination, something that we all sort of are born with and as life goes on we kind of lose uh, sort of slowly but surely and um, to be able to reconnect to that, to be able to uh, imagine again, um, you know, my imagination is what gave me, or gives me, and all of us, but gave me uh, the ability to create. And my ability to create things is what I make a living on and my whole livelihood is about. And to be able to tap into that in a way um, so beautiful and so pure, I, I, couldn't thank these guys enough for letting me into their life and and um, allowing me to reconnect with myself and with them. And that's it. Oh. Oh, we keep we can leave that off. Let's keep it up. It's so nice. Yeah, oh. that's better, right? Yeah. So much better, right? Um, thank you, Dan. That was really uh, great. It was incredible to hear you tell so many detailed stories about about all of these or some of these photographs. Um, what's really apparent to me is the immense respect you have for your subjects um, and the trust that has been established both ways to be able to, to take on a project like this over a period of five years is pretty remarkable. And I'm, you know, I think we look here at this book and this finished body of work and it seems like this, this thing that just um, kind of bubbled up, but I, I can only imagine the process and the kind of patience and delicate nature of, of developing that kind of trust with your subjects over a period of time. And I'm just curious how, how do you even begin to, to do that? It doesn't, you don't just walk in and, and um, take photographs like this. It takes time, I'm thinking, and, and um, um. kind of a certain, I don't know, well, delicacy. I think, for starters, the the boys were uh, so trusting right off the bat, and so open to connect. I think, um, in many ways, the um, having met Crystal and Crystal's work, I'm I'm really lucky because I had a filmmaker doing some of the dirty work for me in a way. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know. I was never there with another crew. It was always just me and my camera. I only had an assistant with me, I think, once or twice throughout the whole thing. It was mostly just us, and so... Without Crystal, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of it was just going over there and sitting down and sitting on the couch and watching movies and kind of hanging out and talking before a camera even came out. And I think... Um, you know, like any like any subject, like even like you know, shooting a portrait in you know having an hour, mm -hmm. you have to just make some kind of an effort to connect before the camera um, comes out. And 
I was really lucky. These guys were really open to it. They were really eager to connect. I think um, because they're boys and have this kind of connection. I, I can speak to guys, you know. Mm -hmm. I can, I can, I can, I can be one of the guys. And they were. I, I guess I've heard them say a few times that I was like, you know, one of those guys that they felt like they really looked up to, and um, it came with a lot of responsibility. I mean, I, I I I had a lot of moments through the years with them, um, and still do, uh, where you know I'm sort of smacked in the face with that responsibility of being kind of a, the big brother, the biggest brother, um, and. You know, it, it, it definitely, it, it, it blurred, lines blurred for sure. Um, but I think ultimately m being present, being there, being available to them as a friend was my kind of best asset. Mm -hmm. And so they were all so giving with their time and with their sort of performances and their just general with themselves, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing that... Um, that I've been wondering about is looking at uh, seeing some of these scenes and knowing that these these guys perform so much for each other every day as part of their own creative expression. They created a world in their apartment, um, and then you bring in an outsider. They're performing for themselves and their maybe their parents, but um, then suddenly there's this outsider, you, who comes in and is photographing them. I'm wondering what. Um, if that changed the way that they performed or if they just immediately snapped into, or not snapped into, but um, felt comfortable in the role of a subject versus their kind of performing for themselves. Because it's, it's a different dynamic, I think, when you're a closed group of six people performing, or, or I guess there were uh, nine, right? Because they were the, the two parents and the sister. Um, they were performing for themselves versus an audience. It's, it's a different dynamic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess at first it was very, actually, I mean, it didn't really take long. It took maybe half a day before they were totally comfortable. Um, half a day. Half a day. Before they were comfortable to go into their closets and reach out and reach, reach and grab a costume and put it on. And I think I was so excited that it must have really, like, you know, gave them more confidence to do more. Um you know, I mean, this in a, it is definitely part of my job in day to day is to kind of make people feel comfortable in front of the camera. But this is, like you said, this is a totally different thing. And also because they're performing, you know, I don't, you know, if I take a portrait of an actor, I'm not, you know, getting them to do what they do on stage mm -hmm. per se. You know, it's, um, I don't know how they do it. Uh, they, it feels to me like they had been practicing for this moment their whole life. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of, um, there was a lot of anticipation for like, they, I think I think at some point in their lives they knew that they were gonna get out of that apartment, that they were gonna meet people. And, and in the meantime, they spent so much time, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of hours, and days, like, practicing so I think in a way they were just perfectly ready for it and I think it really I you know you have to give a lot of credit to their mother who um, you know kept them open and kept them you know uh, emotionally vulnerable and available to do these types of things, not just perform for cameras, but to speak to strangers, you know, I mean, it's not just, you know, this was, this is not, we really have to think about it, like, these these guys weren't, they didn't interact with anybody but each other their whole lives, and, and, and so I think um, Suzanne, the, their mother, really did an incredible job of keeping their outlook positive, keeping a really, um, yeah, just a positive mental outlook on life um, throughout, so that when they did, you know, leave the house and they were able to interact with people, they were they were doing it in a curious and fun and positive way, and not in a fearful way, you know, like like how their father might have had them believe the world was, you know, dangerous. 
Um, I, I mean, I think on that note, as subjects, when they, so you met them five years ago when they had just the, left the house, but just, yeah, right? I'm a little foggy on exactly how long they had been out of the house, but I know it was under like a month or two. So you were, they were right at the beginning. So I'm yeah. also wondering how did their, um, creative process and their comfort in front of the camera and all of those kinds of like you know subtle things change as they spent more and more time in the outside world did it did it kind of change the um <laughs> I don't know that the kind of magic that they had at home in their performances, or did they did they draw influences from other things and uh, out in the world that they were encountering daily, not just from movies anymore. And, and, and sorry, this is three pronged. <laughs> yeah. And then how did that, um, I guess, impact you and what you were doing photographically? Um, well, they definitely the the vibe changed over the course of the five years. It didn't almost change one day you know, from the next necessarily. But I mean, they definitely stopped listening to me at one point, <laughs> which was in a way really great because then they would just do whatever they wanted. But we would lose Eddie and Glenn off in the woods somewhere or like, you know, and I'd have these flashes of like lawsuits um, <laughs> and things like, you know, I'm actually like, wait, why am I, you know, they, they got stuck in, um, in a ditch with a van, a 15 passenger van in the snow in the middle of the night. And I, you know, the cop came and I thought like I had to explain to the cops that I have this van full of boys coming to my house and <laughs> just this really kind of there was a lot of anyway um, yeah yeah it's all fine. <laughs> um, anyway the the they they definitely became more confident a little bit more loose in their um, kind of interpretation of what uh, their performances were it became more just like documenting them as people I mean the last few slides that I showed was just literally me kind of following them around and I'd say you guys want to go to a waterfall you want you guys want to go to a graveyard you guys want to go to the movies you want you know like and it was always just like yeah sure and that would inspire stuff in them and you know initially it was really more like here's the thing that I made when I was 10 and here's this thing that I made when I was 12 and this is Batman 1 and this is Batman you know so it became as much about their kind of just I don't know day to day kind of ramblings as it did uh, about like you know the actual history of uh, the catalog of what they'd made. I mean, and in the book, it starts off with all of that, and then it kind of evolves into more of a, um, a looser kind of, you know, group of images. Um, what was the second question? Sorry. No. Um, uh, I think it was... Um, I think you either answered it, or I think it was... <laughs> I answered it. <laughs> or I answered it. Uh, is anyone keeping track? I don't know. Um, no. They also kind of strike me as a pack of art directors a little bit. Um, so I'm also wondering how, I mean, considering how well art directed their own productions were at home, I'm wondering also how collaborative they were or if they tried to kind of art direct the scenes or places that you would visit or, um, you know, were they actually, did they see your, you shot film, right? All film, yeah. So they couldn't see on the screen, which That's is probably a great key. thing. <laughs> um, um. But did they, yeah, I mean, how involved were they? Um, well, I mean, for starters, all of this stuff that they, they have great taste in films, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, and they're terribly accurate in their costumes and depictions and most of the stuff that they have is um, either made by hand or second second hand from uh, what if you've ever lived in the Lower East Side on Orchard Street there's a fence called the free wall or I guess the boys dubbed it the free wall but that's where when people have clothes that they don't need anymore rather than go to Salvation Army they just kind of throw it onto the fence and so they have a lot of a lot of their stuff was got was uh, acquired from the free wall and I think when you kind of have this like palette of vintage clothing and handmade hand stitched you know taped together outfits or like even just even just like the denim that they chose like a lot of it was just like really well worn and 
you know, it's it just it just uh, for some reason it just works. I mean, they they have an impeccable sense of style, and in a way, to your point about being an art director, I mean, most art directors that I know, they're they're referencing film, and they're referencing you know um, old photographs and things like that, and 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 these guys are, I mean, it's uh, w w it couldn't be more ingrained in their in their mind, this art, this sense of art direction is like in every movie they've seen. There's an art director on every film yeah. they've watched, probably. Um, and so that combined with some kind of like untold sort of swag that that was passed down to them from you know the generation before or whatever. They they I mean they're also in love with the era, the, se the 70s and the 80s and that kind of thing. And so that gives it kind of a look as well. You know when you think about it. And and they're so precise. They wouldn't they wouldn't wear something if it was like a neon or whatever unless they were you know trying to dress like in you know in tron or something i don't know like yeah. they, you know it, it it they they're so particular about what they do and i think part of part of that also had to do with the fact that they had all the time in the world to kind of be particular a lot of us are you know on a different clock you know um but they have incredible style and it made for really great photographs. I mean, a lot of, uh, I, I definitely noticed that a lot of the photographs we love and reference in both in advertising and in um, you know editorial work, a lot of those, re those photographs are from, you know, eras before. And so it, it kind of begats this like great looking stuff. They, they're really, Good looking dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you show them the f the f images as you went through the no. five years? No, I. They had a cat that died. Um, Kurtz. A cat. The cat. He's in the okay. boat. I made sure to put him orange. in the boat. Orange. Orange um, cat. Yeah. Yeah. That was. He was a kitten then. I think it was like the first few days they had him. Um, he got sick and died. And the only image that I showed them up until when the book was coming together um, was that picture I took of the cat because I wanted them to have it. And then, um, yeah, that was it. I didn't want, I didn't see the film until after I finished the book and I didn't show them any images. I didn't want them to think about it. There's this certain, I don't think, I don't know if they'll ever have it again. I think in a way we all lose it once and then that's it. You know, that sense of knowing mm -hmm. what people see when they look at you. Um, that's why, you know, little kids are so great and there's no like, you don't hear about racist three-year-olds or like, you know, people or sexism or anything like that at that age because you're so loose and you're so available and so you know free and without judgment and that's what these boys had at such an age i mean they were in their late into their teens and they still didn't have and still don't have any of that but but to the point of knowing what other people see when they look at you that sort of existential crisis we all go through it you know in our teens if i showed them the pictures they would change or they'd adapt to be something else in the picture you know and i didn't i didn't want that i don't think i i never want that have they seen the pictures now yeah and what have they um it's funny you know with six out of six boys there's all types of opinions um for the most part they're all really excited and and it was um it was uh it was interesting sitting down and showing them all the work finally and when did you do that? About six months ago. Yeah, tell us about that. Um, oh, God, that was really tough. I was so terrified. I mean, I could not have been more scared. Um, you know, because this, as much as we, we all love the idea of it being kind of like a uh, Hollywood sensation and these guys are stars and all that, this is, I mean, this is their life. So I was really, really terrified that I had maybe portrayed one or any of them in in a way that would make them feel bad um there were you know we we all sat down on a couch and i had it on my computer um i kind of did like 
for the boys and their mother together and then at one point I saw I showed it to two of the other guys and they weren't around and it was in bits and pieces um, Suzanne cried she loved them all she's thank God um, and you know, the, uh, for the most part, they all really, I mean, there was a lot of laughter. There was a lot of memories because, you know, they didn't realize I was taking pictures half the time, which is part of what made it so easy for me to, to make the book was because they're so, you know, out just in their in their own world or in our world or they're 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 not thinking about what they look like. They're not all the stuff that we were just saying. They They just... And it was weird because I, I, we were sitting there looking at the pictures and I realized this is like this sort of family album that we have all of a sudden. It's not just like Pretty a... nice family album. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, you make my family album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so it was, um, it was great. You know, there was some tears, um, happy tears. Like I was definitely choking back tears because I was so terrified of what... Um, <coughs> you know, of, of, of any of them being upset. But uh, in the end, it was it was good. I mean, I think um, I think all the attention from the film and now the book and who knows what's next for them. I think I think it's all been a lot for the family, obviously. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, th I, I should probably let them speak for themselves on that particular topic. I, I just I think they've dealt really well with it. Um, and you know, like I said, to this day, they're still all completely, like, beautiful, grounded, amazing young men. And, and what, um, I guess, what was behind the decision to photo not photograph the parents? Um, um, and also, I have another question, too, is, is what was the feedback from the father? So... I didn't photograph the parents because um, this was never, I mean, I guess I, part of me wanted to at first, but then I hadn't met them. The first few visits I went, they sent their parents out of the house knowing that I was coming over, so there was that. But then after a while, you know, I didn't, I didn't want this book to be some kind of expose or like some kind of reportage, you know, document of their l like living conditions or um, the dynamic of the relationship from the, you know, to the father or the mother. There's obviously like, there's a lot there. And I think had I tried to do that photographically, first of all, um, it was, it would have been it just would have been a different project altogether for me. And I, I, it's not that I wasn't interested in that. It's that my way of connecting to people, especially, um, you know, people in situations that I'm not really kind of familiar with, um, isn't by prying into their life. It's by sort of finding like a middle ground. Which is probably why you were able to yeah, yeah. Like I never, I, such about a I barely part. ever spoke to them about their dad. They love talking about their mom. Um, their relationship with their dad is really complicated, obviously. And I think that um, you know, it, uh, you know, the other the other part of it is that there was I knew there was a film being made about it. Mm -hmm. So here I am, you know, and and I talked to Crystal about it, the director, and 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 there was a point where it was like I said. Now, I don't want to make a still photo, photo a still photograph of your film you know I never that's not what I want to do and that's um, I don't think it's fair to her um, you know I had to be uh, I wanted to be really respectful of the fact that um, she this is this was this was her sort of um, story to tell mm -hmm. and so I kind of had to find my own story and and it was for me more rewarding anyway because I I it we, you know we've seen we've seen Bruce Davidson and we've seen you know some of the other you know works of what 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 pe how people live in impoverished situation not that they're quite impoverished but I would say living in in the projects on on welfare and um 
and, and food stamps in nine people in a three bedroom apartment, you would think the photographs would look quite different from yeah. what you see. And I, I just didn't, I don't know, it didn't appeal to me in that way. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, I think you're right. I don't think that they read to me at all as um, anything other than incredibly visually rich an incredibly visually rich place to grow up. Um, but I also, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the first time that you took the boys upstate, because I think, um, I think as a photographer trying to capture such an intense, what I think would be a really intense moment of kind of watching that kind of creative um, freedom explode out onto a field upstate for the first time touching grass or it wasn't was it the first time touching grass and in the water um, and no they definitely touched grass i mean if you count the east river park as grass then they've touched grass so, yeah. um no it was uh it was their first time kind of uh being let out into a place where there wasn't and kind of um Traffic and lights. How much and time did you have for them that first um, trip? We did a few trips. I think we did three trips, and each one was like you know a weekend. Okay. Um, and it was amazing the first time they came up because they came with enough baggage. You would think they were moving up there, but um, <laughs> they had so many bags, and obviously that was all their costumes and all the different sort of options and masks and things like that, um, which I was obviously really grateful for because that just meant we had more things to play with. Um, one thing that um, Suzanne, the mother, really, I think, instilled in the boys, mostly, I mean, they all have a real connection to it, but um, I think Narayana, uh, Narayana and uh, Bhagavan are kind of the most sort of earthy out of all of them, but their mother was a real hippie. I mean, really, with, uh, tell them stories as, as they were growing up about nature and about rivers and lakes and oceans and all the trees and how, you know, like how the world, you know, kind of, I guess, this symbiotic relationship between everything and really beautiful spiritual and kind of, I don't know, just beautiful stuff that they would that she would convey to them and so when they got upstate there were all these moments in the book where they're going into the river and like it's almost like they're drinking from the fountain of youth they're putting water on their faces when they went swimming for the first time um and there were all these really magical moments because especially with those two because you know, they're all vegetarian as well. Well, not Govinda anymore. He's like a proud meat eater. <laughs> um, he went the other way. But the, but the rest of them, um, you know, they, they, they really took that from their mother. And so getting them up, upstate where, you know, there's all this vast expanses and, and all that stuff, they was, it was great to see how they um, really, really dug into it and really, like, they... If you, even even I, I you know there's places where I would drive by constantly and look and you know that was pretty, but you know after being there with them it was like wow you know like feel the mud in between your hands and like smell of the water and the trees and you know climb the trees and all those things so it was all really really pretty amazing. What would your what would you say your uh, greatest challenge it, it would be from this body work? creating this body of work as a photographer. Like moving was. forward? No, I, th I think maybe looking back, maybe you can, oh. maybe looking back and forward um, also, but what, looking back, what would you say if, was there anything that, or is there anything that sticks out in your mind as, as a moment of challenge? Yeah, when you're I don't doing? know if it's so much a moment as, uh, the, the biggest challenge for me was always like finding that kind of, um, that, place where you're not pushing them to do things they don't want to do and you're not affecting them you know in a way that is sort of tarnishing what you're doing what you're documenting so to speak and also not letting yourself down like not coming home after a day of shooting with them and thinking like oh shit i should have gotten him to do this or i should maybe maybe if we did that you know like there's the, i think that's true for for most photographers you know um there's always that one shot that you probably could have gotten mm -hmm. but then it's it's like you know what we've been talking about it's a really fine line between um how to 
do that in a way where you're not manipulating things because then it becomes sort of staged and that was never i mean m my voice as a photographer i like to think is more about i'm more a witness than i am mm -hmm. a manipulator um and the second part second answer to that same question is the biggest challenge is going to be finding the subject or subjects in the future that will allow me this kind of access and interest. I think you have a room of people who would love to have you do their family photo album going yeah, forward. Well, they're not as interesting as I these mean, guys, though. I think we all collectively uh, resent that. No. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that would be great <laughs> but i mean just just to find i mean where do you find yeah. such this is a once in a lifetime project and i yeah. kind of have to just live with that and not i'm not going to try and do this again exactly you know i mean there's no way to do this again i'm not going to knock on every door in the projects looking for people that haven't been let out of their house or like go well, into the woods and like yeah i mean your last book project was a completely different yeah project altogether maybe yeah. you want to say for a quickie just what this what your other book is um i know we're talking about this tonight but just to give some idea of the um the range of your work your projects um my other work was landscapes I and mean, there's no people there was maybe like two or three people in the whole book um that was more a book i did out of necessity i think a project that i did um i did it when i was out of college i'd had a show it's called the i sold West. a few pieces and i was broke and i had to get a job um and so, uh, you know, I went from an environment um, at school where, you know, all you had to do was create work and show it and create more work and show it to, you know, New York City where I had to earn a living and eat. Um, and so I started assisting photographers. And in the meantime, the only, the only spare time I found for myself uh, to shoot would be kind of on the road. And so that's where that whole project started. And then, and then I started seeking the road out. And for me, it was, I don't know, that project, I still, I, I flipped through the book the other day, actually. Um, I went to a uh, school to do a class with um, an old schoolmate of mine as an art teacher now, and I brought this book and I brought that book, and I was sitting um, on my way there and I was looking at them both, and there's something, I, I still really love so many of those images, and they're so different from what I did here, and um, yeah, I don't really know Maybe someday I'll understand the connection. <laughs> right now, it was—I mean, that was that, that was born of a, a just a desire to photograph, and just like I just needed to shoot something, and I didn't have a wolf pack, and I didn't have you know access to, uh, um, I guess, a subject matter that I could create a, a larger body of work. So I just started. I, I shot nothingness, kind of. That book is called um, Photographs uh, from the American Southwest, by the way. In case, and, and maybe it's for sale at the Strand? I don't know. Maybe we might have a couple copies somewhere. <laughs> so it's, I mean, maybe you can get two books signed information tonight. <laughs> for the price of one, or for the price of two. I <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> um, how are we doing on time? I want to make sure there's time for people to ask questions. I think we should probably we could talk throw it to the audience for a, for a long couple time. questions. I feel like people yeah, have been sitting on some. Yeah, I can raise your hands. I can pass. I'll, I'll bring you a mic. Just raise your hand. Oh, you've got a mic. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll sit question. here then. When you started the project, did you know the time frame of five years or was that kind of, like, how did you um, determine that? No, not at all. I mean, even up until nine months or what's uh, 11 months ago, I had no idea. Um, I was just shooting them. And I knew that I had a book, you know, probably by year two or three, I knew that I was like, I had a project. Um, but then it, uh, but then it really became about when is the movie going to come out and what's going to happen with the movie. I didn't want to release the, the book before the film. That was kind of a, more or less a, a promise that I had made to, uh, to Crystal, the director. And I also thought it would just, you know, it's just smarter to, to just keep shooting until this thing became you know, was, their timing was right. Um, and then they won Sundance. And then it was like, make a book now. <laughs> Good, like, go. And anyone who uh, has ever worked in publishing or has ever made a book before knows that 
a nice time frame would be about 18 months to two years to, to make a book and we got it together really from the moment we um, decided it was had to be edited and become a book to the time it went to print um, I, I saw where's I don't see him anymore. Um, my publisher was here. Uh, I think it was like three and a half months, something crazy like that. And then, um, yeah, so I mean, it's the book's out now. It's November, and we started this in late February, really. So it was, it was quick. Um, yeah. Anybody else have a question? I saw somebody over there. I just wanted to know what happened to the sister. Um, or what was she just oh, not included? I, swore <laughs> I was. <laughs> she's she she suffer. Damn it! I can never remember. What's it called? William. William syndrome. Okay, she suffers from William syndrome. Um, I don't think I could quite describe. Um, the exact type of syndrome or disease w w that it is, but basically, she's like a child. She's the eldest out of all the all the family, I think, and she's more or less functions as a four-year-old. Um, she's incredible, though, as well. I actually really adore her, and I took some pictures of her that are separate. But I never, I think, to that same point of it not being like kind of a documentary about how they. Uh, <laughs> um, about how they kind of grew up you know it wasn't about like this like reportage thing I didn't and also because she didn't probably understand what was happening I didn't feel like I should be kind of shooting her um, and so out of respect for that um, you know I didn't I also it it was also the, the film was kind of more about the, the boys as well. I just have one more question. How do you think they had such good taste in films? That was the one thing like their where dad... Did that come from? It's a great Their question. dad gave with, them... With no kind of he, influence. He, their dad... His dad. Was, uh, the dad, who I only met one time in the five years, and it was pretty recently. I think it was about six months ago. Or not only, maybe in January. Anyway, he had amazing taste in music, amazing taste in films, um, and that's all he gave them. I mean, that's, from what I can tell, that was like the main sort of gift was you can't go out of the house, you can't interact with society, you can't, you know, have friends, you can't play, you can't feel wind or rain or any of these things. But you can have ACDC, and you can have Friday the Thirteenth, Full Metal Jacket, and Full Metal Jacket. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, it. He felt like those were culturally important things for children to have, and and for whatever reason that, I mean, in a way, he's right. That's the whole irony, <laughs> of the whole thing. <laughs> it's is so yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like it it when you say it out loud, like this guy trapped his family in their house for seventeen Just years. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 like it's like what it's it sounds horrible. Like you should be thrown in jail, but then then you meet these kids and they're amazing, and you're like, wow, maybe maybe there's something to to it. I, I, I don't think any of them would the ever do it again. But <laughs> so, yeah, but um, yeah. So, Dad. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. We have another one over there. Um, I was just wondering, what were what was the boys' perception of you as an artist? Like, did they understand the the final product as being a book about their lives, or did they, since they're so into performing, did they view it as they were characters, or what was their perception of you? Their well, their perception of me was that I was a friend that took pictures all the time, and that was the hardest thing. Excuse me. That was the hardest thing for me to kind of cross over from friend to photographer. I don't think, and it was that was that was probably the biggest lesson that I had in the whole five years. Um, mainly because I'd never done anything like this before, but also um, that we make all these assumptions that people understand things. 
in life, you know, strangers on the street. Um, and all of them kind of go out the window with these guys. And so it took a while before I realized that. And when I did finally explain to them, you know, that this was becoming a book, it was... I was, I was shocked to s to find that a few, not all of them, a few of them were like, yeah, right, right. What, what else are you doing? Of course. But a few of them were really taken aback and kind of surprised and didn't, and, and it took, and it took away some of the trust that I had with them. And it took a little bit of, a lot of work. And still to this day, um, you know, there, there's one, one of the brothers is really doesn't, is not interested in being a part of the film. He doesn't want to be a part of the book. He doesn't want to be in the press. He doesn't, you know, and I understand it. If I was, so he's, he's 18 now. And I'm like, and when I was 18, would I have wanted everybody in the world to know every last detail of how I grew up and like the dysfunction in my house and all that stuff like I'd be mortified um, so in a way I identify with him the most it, it, but it was it was that was definitely the hardest thing hardest sort of obstacle that I had and it came very late in the game it was really like uh, a shock to me because and now if I ever do another project like anything like this again or ever shoot you know enter anyone's life in this way ever again I, I I'm definitely I'm gonna have to do it differently there's no there's no way to there's no way to do it otherwise we have time for one or two more hey Josh hey dude <laughs> Um, you use the word uh, dysfunction, and I wonder, also for Crystal, but um, you know, for you along this process, did you ever come up against your own feelings or anxieties about fetishizing or romanticizing the victims of that dysfunction and child abuse and poverty? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it would be apparent to anybody who was allowed into that house that the overwhelming feeling was love and the overwhelming feeling was um, e this energy where everyone within the house was connected um, I you know it, it made me really reassess the term poverty the whole project because I don't look at these guys as impoverished. When you have that much support and love and vulnerability and um, sort of kindness in the house, in spite of all of the so sort of dysfunction, um, I it's not that I didn't, I wasn't aware of, of what I was doing. I was constantly thinking about like, okay, well, I don't want to fetishize. And, and, I, and I have loads of pictures of random things around the house that if you were to re-edit this book, it would look like one of those sort of stories. Um, but I never, I never um, wanted it to be that. And, and, and it was definitely, it was always on my mind, constantly. Um, in the back of my mind, if anything, but but um, m the bigger story was always for me um, the beauty that was kind of born out of all that, and and not the the kind of um, economic or like um, f familial challenges that they faced um, because they were so much stronger than them. I mean, you can see it in them now. Time for one last question. If anybody is thinking on anything, cool. Hey Dan, how you doing? Um, mm -hmm. Will you continue photographing the boys, or is that the end of the project? Um, I'd like to. I think I need a break. <laughs> I think they need a break. They, these guys have been on the road for. Oh God! Almost a year now promoting the film, and you know, they're at. I mean, it's so crazy to me because a year ago they had never 
you know, the only place they'd ever been outside of Lower East Manhattan essentially was upstate New York and Coney Island and a few other spots in between. And now, you know, I'm on their Instagram and they're in Rome or they're in Stockholm or they're, you know, like meeting you know, some director at his premiere in LA and staying at the Chateau Marmont. And it's like, I, I'm like, what, who are these guys? You know, so, so it's really, it's a different story now. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I mean, you know, I'd love to photograph them because they're, because I love photographing them. But um, for now, I'm, I'm definitely gonna give it a break. I don't know if there's another book in there. Um, I'd love to kind of get a little kind of real world reunion thing together with them <laughs> and like take their pictures again, you know, maybe next year or something. But um, you're not the you're not the first person to ask me that, and I definitely, you know, their lives are continuing to be fascinating. I think for me right now, I really have to just invest in being their friends and and showing them that like you know as the book comes out and all of the kind of things that happen around, you know releasing a book for me kind of come and go and fade that my relationship with them is bigger than making work out of their lives and I think like by not kind of following them around and trying to get more images from them and really establishing more of a like long-term friendship I think that's sort of my my bigger goal now with them all right. Well, thank you both so much for coming, and thank you, Dan, for this thank really you. wonderful book. Thanks to everybody else for coming out.